your first Bitcoin is the easiest. So we're at 65,000 a Bitcoin. You're going to have to make a sacrifice or two. You're just a normal family, a normal person living on a normal income. You got to make a sacrifice, but that's going to show exactly where your priorities lie. I had eight rental properties. I sold six of them. I got in a Bitcoin with that. Most of my stocks that like tech companies, all that stuff is gone. You don't want to hold assets that are denominated in a currency that's just falling. Someone can take something from you. It's not really yours. 2022, I got kicked out of a bank because I said the word Bitcoin. You put your money into the bank, that's the bank's money. And they'll give you access to it until they don't. Your money is a proxy of your time and they're taking your money via taxes or inflation. They're stealing the time from you, but you can't get that time back. Both sides, the red side, the blue side, they're both fighting for access to the money machine right to the money printer they need to work with the federal reserve so they can make up all these imaginary bills get them passed get them signed create bonds out of nowhere so then the fed can buy them and then that creates more inflation the richest people in the history of the world couldn't do what i'm doing right now which is i was eating crab legs and watching youtube john d rockefeller couldn't do this i used to wake up in the morning and look for stocks to trade and now i just go water my grass You treat it, whatever you do, however you do, get to one whole Bitcoin, yeah. uh, which is, I think, an, a message that I really, really like, uh, even though I'm aware that not everyone on the earth right now, uh, for them, it's possible to do that. But I think most of the, my listeners actually are capable of going there if they really want to, or they're already there. Um, but what is it exactly of this like one Bitcoin? Why is that Bitcoin getting the one Bitcoin so so important for you? Well, one, I believe that wherever you spend your money and how you spend your energy, your time, it shows a lot about your priorities. So to get to one Bitcoin is to say, like, I'm on this journey, you know? So I think pushing yourself because what's, what for most people is going to require you, one, to catch Bitcoin early or two, to make sacrifices to get there. Right. So at this price, you know, we're at 65,000 a Bitcoin, you're going to have to make a sacrifice or two. You know, if you're just a normal family, a normal person living on a normal income, you got to make a sacrifice. But that's going to show exactly where your priorities lie. So I also had this saying that, like, you know, your first Bitcoin is the hardest because if Bitcoin's going up, then, you know, when you were able to buy a Bitcoin for two, three thousand dollars or five thousand dollars versus down for sixty five thousand that would make your first one harder, you know? So I think once you climb that hill, you get your first one and you're like, all right, that's, that's our, sorry, your, your first Bitcoin's the easiest because the price goes up. Right. And, but it becomes like a matter of priority. So what are you willing to do to get there? And as you're learning, you start to understand the importance of, you know, selling that fiat to get you a Bitcoin. So I think it just, to me, it shows that this is a priority to you. And you are, but I think you're still invested in other things or how, how much of a priority for you already uh, Bitcoin is? So, all right. So I had eight rental properties. I sold six of them, right? Got in a Bitcoin with that. Most of my stocks that like tech companies, all that stuff is gone, right? So, yeah, I, I still have some cars that are going to go. I still have those two rental properties that got to go, but I've been on a serious mission. So now at this point, I'm putting like maybe 80, 90 percent of my uh, uh, income away. So when 2022, when Bitcoin fell under like twenty five thousand, that's why I was like, all right, I need to make, you know, a decision what whether I'm going to try to catch the rebound in the stock market or I'm going to stop dabbling in Bitcoin and actually go all in, you know, and started start to make it a priority. So that's what I started doing. So. I start buying and buying and buying and I'm showing people and telling people and educating people like I'm going to lead by example. This is what I'm doing. I'll let you guys know I'm getting rid of this rental property. I'm getting rid of these stocks. So I kind of like documented all this for, you know, my investment group. And I'm like, this is, you know, I'm leading by example. Like this is that serious to me. It's, it's really cool to, to see that. It's also like you have so many investment uh possibilities and opportunities like you have stocks uh, as you said you have real estate rental properties you even have businesses you can buy your income and stuff like that yep. um why is bitcoin better than all those stocks real estate and other opportunities why what does make bitcoin so um uh, attractive right now all right so one all those stocks are denominated in dollars and the value of the dollar is going down so 
like I heard Michael Saylor say, you have the best seat on the Titanic. It doesn't matter. You're still on the Titanic, you know? So that's like, that was kind of obvious. But another thing was dealing with the maintenance cost of things. So there's the cost to purchase something. And then there's the true value of that thing, right? So for instance, I live in my home, but I have to pay property taxes or my rental properties. I have to, there's maintenance, there's, there's insurance, there's all these things. And then you have to deal with the tenants and you have to screen tenants, deal with their issues and help them, you know, apply for this voucher or do this or do that. And then when they move out, you're spending more money. So there's like a maintenance required for, let's say, real estate, you know, so you're basically paying to upkeep your own property. Right. So going down this Bitcoin journey made me realize, like, OK, well, what is like what is ownership? You know, so, for instance, this house that I, that I live in. I bought this house and then every year I'm paying $50,000 in property taxes. And it makes me wonder like, okay, do I actually own it if I have to keep paying to maintain it? Right. Even though, you know, I own it in cash, it's basically like me renting it from the government because I have to keep paying or someone's going to take it from me. So then during this journey of, you know, learning about Bitcoin, I start realizing like, what is ownership? You know, so it made me question a lot of things, but one of the main things was, one, you don't want to hold assets that are denominated in a currency that's just falling. And then two, the maintenance cost of whatever that you're buying and storing your value in. I, I think that's that that's really cool. Um, how did it change? It seems like it changed something uh, in you, your perception or your definition of, of ownership. How did that change? Like what, what did you thought before of ownership and how do you think now about ownership? Yeah. So what I started to realize is like, if someone can take something from you, it's not really yours. Right. Or if someone can force you to keep paying on something, it's not really yours. So I have a lot of cars. I have a car collection. Right. And every year I have to pay to re-register these cars. And I'm like, even when you think like, oh, I bought this car, it's mine. It's not yours. You know, like, if you have to keep registering it. So what I started realizing is what these governments do is they take all these rights away from you and then they sell them back to you, you know? And the more I started looking at it like that, I'm like, yeah, the things that you, the, the things that you, can be taken from you aren't yours. You know, it's, you're just renting them from the government or until you make the wrong person mad, then they'll come take them. And that's when I started kind of like realizing like, oh, this is, this is like a very important aspect of Bitcoin, you know? And I've been kicked, 2022, I got kicked out of a bank, right? And I got kicked out of a bank because I said the word Bitcoin, right? So what I was doing is, and this is Navy Federal for you guys out there watching, you Americans out there watching, especially you veterans. So I used to have to call Navy Federal to send a wire to Coinbase, right? So I can buy Bitcoin. So every day I'm sending these wires. And of course it's suspicious because I'm sending like, you know, a decent amount of money. And then what ends up happening is one time they like have to transfer me. Well, they always have to transfer me to the security officer or whatever. And she asked me questions like, oh, what do the funds come from? All that stuff. And I'm like, yeah, I own these businesses. You know, I get business deposits Monday through Friday. That's where the money comes from, blah, 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 like that. She's like, oh, like what? Well, she's making it seem like almost like, you know, she's actually curious. And she's like, oh, so what kind of business is it? And I'm like, well, I have different businesses. I have e-commerce business. I have educational businesses. I have real estate businesses. You know, she's like, oh, what, like, what do you educate people about? And I'm like, real estate, stocks, Bitcoin. She stopped me dead in my track. She said, oh, you have a Bitcoin business. You can't bank here. I said, no, it's not a Bitcoin business. It's an educational business. And we teach people about Bitcoin. She said, that's a Bitcoin business. Kick me out, kick my partner out. And I'm like, okay, then it becomes a hassle to go get the money that you have sitting in that account. And then I have credit cards with this company or with this uh, bank. So I have to drive to the bank to go pay. And I'm like, this is such an inconvenience, you know? And it, just any given second, someone can decide that you said the wrong thing or that, you know, whatever their bank policies are, and I'm sure they have them for good reasons, but they can just up and, you know, kind of reroute your life and your day and, you know, make this thing a big hassle. And you think that your first instinct is like, that's my money, you know? And then as you start to learn about Bitcoin, you realize like, no, you put your money into the bank, that's the bank's money. And they'll give you access to it until they don't, you know? Or until it's a security problem and then, you know, they got to review it and then you can come get your money from the branch in three weeks. And you're like, man, this is really inconvenient. That's so crazy. Uh, like the, there's a Bitcoin founder that I met on a, uh, on a, on a conference and he said like, he, he, he founded a Bitcoin company in Austria and he said like, 
if you found anything with Bitcoin, just don't call it anything with Bitcoin because you have problems down the yeah. road. Don't, don't call it anything with Bitcoin. Anything at all. And I, and I kind of knew that. And I was just like, yeah, it's an educational company, you know, like, cause that's what we do. We educate people, you know? And she's like, oh, like, that's really cool. Like, what do you educate people about? I'm like, stocks, real estate, Bitcoin. She's like, it's a Bitcoin company. I'm like, this lady right here. So it's, man, it's things like that where you start to realize like, man, like this, this whole system is kind of set up. So you keep having to go to work. So you have to keep paying on things, right? You keep paying into the system. And then the system is kind of designed in a way where I don't necessarily know if they want you to, if they want to have more, let, let's say with taxes, or they want you to have less, right? Because the less you have, then the less sovereign you can become, you know? And you start to realize like, man, this game is just a big system of like, taking things from people and if your money is a proxy of your time and they're taking your money via taxes or inflation they're stealing the time from you but you can't get that time back you know so your time is your luxury and there's nothing that anyone can do to give you any time back you know so a, a good way to like think about this is if you put a thousand hours of work in and in, in exchange you get a hundred thousand dollars and then you go to the store and you're only able to spend 80,000 of it. Well, they just took 20% of that, right? So in a way you could find a way to make more money, but you can't find a way to get those hours back. So you were robbed that way with inflation. But if they give you a hundred thousand dollars and you have to pay 20,000 for taxes, it's the same thing, right? That's unpaid work that you were doing. So either way, if money is a proxy of your energy and your time, they just stole it from you. And I start thinking about things like that. It's, it's also crazy for me that uh, they even ask you where the funds are coming from. Like, wh wh why do, do they ask if they ha have they a good yeah. reason for, for that? Yeah, that's yeah, that's another thing, too. You're like, well, man. Like, and then what's crazy is you can like o just open the account and you'll see like Stripe, you know, like Gumroad Stripe and then or this like county paying real estate or or like, you know, whatever. And you're like, okay, you could kind of already see where it's coming from. Now you're questioning me about having money because it's an unnormal amount of money, but who's to say what's normal? Who's to say what's not, you know, it's all relative. So yeah. And, and then I think just like the power that one person can have to be like, all right, you're out of this bank. You know, I'm like, man, I've been banking here for like 10 years, you know, and I say one word and it's a wrap for me, you know, and that was pretty wow. annoying, man. Wait, wait, you banked with them 10 years and just because of that one conversation mm -hmm. where you mentioned Bitcoin, they, they kicked you out? Yeah, and they kicked my business partner out. She didn't even call them and talk to them about anything, but just her association with the business because we have, we both have our individual accounts and then we have the business bank account. And they seen she was tied to the business bank account. They kicked her out too. You're like, this is <laughs> That's crazy. That's crazy. How much do you think this now changes with the BlackRock ETF, with the Bitcoin ETFs and the regulatory frameworks, maybe even with like a Trump in, in administration? Oh, oh, sorry. You are in America, right? Yeah. Uh, uh -huh. I, I think you're like, how, what impact do you think, uh, the uh, Trump talking about Bitcoin friendly, a Bitcoin ETF coming into the scene now? Do, does that change things? Is that like now the turning point for, for all those things where then banks all of a sudden accept Bitcoin? Yep. So I think there's different levels of acceptance that Bitcoin will go through and the, the easier or the more accepted Bitcoin is, I think the higher price people will pay. But when, so for instance, all the, 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 um, Bitcoin holders that front ran, uh, BlackRock, you get in at a better price, right? Pre ETFs, post ETFs. But I think what happens is now you have this very large asset manager that's vouching for, you know, this, this, uh, this commodity. So then what happens is all their business partners will then, you know, recognize it to include banks, to include, you know, um, your, your congressmen, your senators, your, your, the president itself. So yeah, I think as it becomes more and more accepted, then yeah, it'll trickle down to the banks and to individual people looking at you to stop looking at you funny when you talk about Bitcoin, you know, cause people are like, uh, either you're a crook or you're a criminal or you're doing something weird or you're into this magic internet money. So I think it, it is slowly but surely becoming uh, like normalized. And I think if not this election, then the next election for sure, like there's going to be a lot of this is what we're going to do for these people who are holding this token. 
Yeah, it's, it's crazy in America. I don't know if that study is true, but I saw it where there's more Bitcoin owners than dog owners. So it's like kind of like if you're against Bitcoin, <laughs> you have a hard time getting elected these days. Yeah, I, I don't... <laughs> Nah, I wouldn't think that's true, man. Everybody out here has a damn dog. You go to the gym, everybody has a dog with them. You go to the dentist, everyone has a dog with them. And you talk about somebody, you talk to uh, about Bitcoin with somebody, and they're looking at you like, <laughs> they're looking at you crazy, man. So, But, yeah, I, I think that, you know, Bitcoin might get mentioned a little bit in this election, and we're, like, with three weeks out. But I think for sure the next election is going to be a big deal. Absolutely, really cool. Do you think that uh, the election, like whether Trump or Harris will it be, do you think that has an actual impact on, on, on the Bitcoin price? Nothing major. I, I don't think it matters. This is, this is what I think about politics. Both sides, the red side, the blue side, they're both fighting for access to the money machine, right? To the money printer. They need to work with the Federal Reserve so they can make up all these imaginary bills, get them passed, get them signed, create um, these bonds out of nowhere so then the fed can buy them and then that creates more inflation right so i think that's the big thing that the american people don't see so if me and you are for example are running for president and i say if i were to say in like true terms i say hey if you guys vote for me i'll use the money printer to do x y and z and then you'll say hey if you guys vote for me i'll use the money printer to do x y and z and then we both collectively say but the money printer is going to be turned on. Therefore, there's going to be inflation, you know, and if American people can look at it like that, maybe we'll stop being fooled so easily. Yeah, it's, it's, it's true. Like yeah. no matter who you're voting for, they, they both will continue the, that fiat system. Yeah. Is, what, what do you think is the, the next step for, for Bitcoin? We kind of have like the groundwork now laid out with the Bitcoin ETF. We have uh, corporations now with, with uh, MicroStrategy and a lot of other uh, corporations in, into Bitcoin, even though it's like just in the beginning. Uh, nation states, yes, a little bit with El Salvador, America, maybe with Trump. Uh, Germany, definitely not. They, they are selling their Bitcoin. <laughs> selling. <laughs> are you in Germany? I'm almost in Germany, like in Austria, but okay. in Austria, it's not better because we don't have any Bitcoin, so we never sold. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. I don't know if that's better or worse. I've been to Austria before, actually. I used to live in uh, Europe. So, all right, this is what I think. I think what happens next is I think there needs to be mass education, right? So one of the reasons why the fiat system keeps going is because the people in the system are also the people who oversee education, right? So if they just keep educating you in the same way or the same system saying, hey, this is what works or this is how things are supposed to go. This is why you can get people who can get up to the master's degree level, the PhD level of economics and still have no idea what the hell is going on, you know? So I think it's things like this podcast. I think it's things like, you know, the people on social media who are sitting around every day educating people because what ends up happening is like I used to follow uh, some some Bitcoiners like maybe 2017, 2018. They start off sounding like kooky people. You know, they're like, yeah, yeah, OK, bro. And then the price goes up and not only not is not that it's you're only in it for the price to go up, but it kind of validates what they're saying, you know, and then you have things like um, donation funds from the truckers in Canada being put on hold. And then you have things like there's these things that happen in society that kind of lead to evidence as like, okay, maybe these orange pill people aren't wrong, you know? And it's when all these conspiracies become coincidences and then you're like slowly, slowly but surely, but it's, there's a, a multiplier effect, you know, these things compound. So when you have people out there who can create a podcast and then get, you know, let's say you do a podcast and it gets 10,000 views, right? And you're looking at it because you're the podcast creator and you're like, oh, 10,000 people, 5,000 people. You don't realize that people sit, they watch it, and then no one's just going to watch something, find it interesting and not tell their brother about it or not tell their coworker about it, right? These are conversations that people have every day. So then those people are like, hey, like, actually, I was learning about this and then it spreads and it spreads and it spreads. Right. So everything compounds. So even when you think of the smallest podcast, the Bitcoin podcast, I end up finding them 
and they get 88 views. And I'm like, man, this is some good stuff right here, you know? And then I turn and I talk to my circle of friends about it and everything just kind of compounds. So I think one of the major things, major, one of the major steps is the individual people, right? The individual people self-educating. Because if we're, if we're going to sit back and wait on the system, then what's going to happen is it's going to take forever. We're going to just play the fiat game, right? It's going to take forever. It needs to be passed by these through the school district, which means the state needs to approve of it, which means the people in the state need to approve of it. The governor needs to approve of it, but maybe he doesn't. So now you've got people in 23 states being educated about, you know, Bitcoin or even like the, the train of thought from the Austin School of Economics. And then you have the other states that are like, oh, no, nah, we're not doing that. You know, so I think it starts with, uh, the people in each person and then the the kind of the proof or the backbone in this this hey the system works is you're like hey we have these outlets look even BlackRock is you know allowing people to buy ETF or you can go to this company and buy it yourself you can self custody with these people which are usually just everyday people who are creating products you know so I think the work's going to be done from the inside out you know, it's going to start with the orange pill people and it's just going to spread and spread and spread, you know, and I think that's why when you see um, people like Jack Mallers talking to NFL players, you know, very prominent NFL players at that, you're like, this is crazy. You know, like this guy's a leader on a professional football team. You think he's going to go in the locker room and just be quiet, you know? Like, of course he's not. And then, of course, like after the game, they win, everyone's talking, and then the price of Bitcoin shoots up like it does today. And they're like, hey, man, like, so you took your contract in, or you took your endorsement endorsements in Bitcoin, huh? Like these things spread and these people have influence. So I've seen Michael Saylor comment on uh, Ronaldo's uh, tweet yesterday, you know, and I'm like, these things spread like crazy, but it's going to start from the inside out. I, I saw that, I saw that tweet. I think Ronaldo brings out like uh, watches or something like that, mm -hmm. like a watch yep. collection. And I thought like, Hey, there's a Bitcoin watch collection also. <laughs> yeah. It's, it, <laughs> And it's crazy because uh, I was there and I, I had like a watch collection that I was looking at like an investment. And what ended up happening is um, I was thinking like, okay, here's the demand for these watches, right? And then here's the supply. And I'm like, oh, this is pretty cool. You know, every, every watch I was buying is as soon as you walk out of Rolex, it's up 40% or Vacheron or whatever, you know, you're up 40, 50%. And then at a moment's notice, they just snap their fingers boom, more supply, you know? And you're like, this is a fiat game. This is a fiat game that you're trying to play. And it goes to, to show that like the inability to save your, you know, your time and your, and your energy, which is, you know, your money, it leads you to gambling. And that's how I started looking at my, my former self. Like, man, that was gambling. That That's so interesting. Yeah. It's also, um, this all for, kind of connects like the the education system is really bad but now we're getting a new like decentralized education system with social media with the podcast with all those things then we have like this inflation this nine to five rat race which also gets better with bitcoin and online education uh, it, it's kind of all connected for me and and and, and i kind of like i feel like we're entering in a new uh, world era where uh, people are way more free if they really want to. Like it's yep. now on everyone's mind. Like if you can afford a phone, you don't have an excuse anymore. Yep. Mm -hmm. Like if you're on an interconnection is like almost everything you need to like conquer the world these days. It's, it's crazy to think about that, but uh, I, I love the implications uh, of that. And I love how you also explain uh, that. Yeah. The, the education matters a lot because that's what gets people to hold when you know, or to huddle when it goes down. That's what gets people to buy in when it goes down. It's when people are afraid to buy the dip is because they don't have a very thorough understanding, right? They don't have a thorough understanding of how this system works or how Bitcoin works or why this thing is valuable. So they're like, ah, it's going down. Maybe, you know, they're paper hands or maybe they buy more, but it's all from education, right? And I was making a joke yesterday that like, the richest people in the history of the world couldn't do this is last night at dinner. I'm like, couldn't do what I'm doing right now, which is I was eating crab legs and watching YouTube. Right. And I'm like, John D Rockefeller couldn't do this. Right. Right. Like Mansa Musa couldn't get crab legs right here and sit and have someone who he does not know and just sit here and educate him on something, you know, and you're like, this is what's cool. Like the, the technology has empowered everybody, but it's on the individual person to actually like apply it, you know, 
to reach out and you you build your own like ecosystem on the internet, the people you follow. It's really like you versus your attention span at this point. Yeah, it's like the the average person in 2024 is way richer than the richest guy like yeah. a, a few hundred years ago. Yeah, I'm like, man, you could have been as rich as you want to, but you didn't have plumbing. <laughs> like, like this is a cool time to live in, you know? Like, I have plumbing, I have air conditioning, people gather crabs for me to eat it, and i get to sit and watch some guy across the world talk about you know this magic internet money i kind of like my life you know <laughs> it's pretty cool what a time to be alive really cool um what do you think primed you to understand bitcoin because i feel like uh, even like there are a lot of rich dudes a lot of smart dudes that have no clue about bitcoin uh, and it's just like a very small group of people that actually understand and grasp Bitcoin right now. What yeah. do you think primed you to, to actually understand it? All right. So before I had any type of like real money, like I was paying attention to Bitcoin, right? So my first Bitcoin buy was in 2017 and it was strictly for the purpose of trying to make more money, right? So me and my cousin Johnny were just like, halfway reading these books halfway kind of paying attention you know but we're just like we want the number to go up you know so i'm thinking i'm some mad scientist and i buy it three thousand sell it six thousand i think i'm the king of the world it goes up to twenty thousand and then i'm sitting here looking at my cousin like bro what did we do wrong you know so then it crashes and then i'm like well i guess i did that right you know <laughs> like, i didn't i didn't miss out so then what ended up happening is like 2019 I'm like buying in as I'm starting to make more money. I'm buying in. I would like, I'd buy a whole coin for $4,000, sell it for 7,000 or buy it for eight and sell it for 12. And I'm just thinking, I'm like thinking like a trader, you know, but how the saying goes, like you come, you come for the number go up and you stay for the revolution, you know? So then what would happen is I would start following traders who would like trade Bitcoin and, you know, I'm like, all right, this is pretty cool, you know? And then I started to find like, uh, people who are like very deeply into this, you know, like Naval, for example, right? So you, you, you know, and follow Naval. Naval I know Radikar. actually not. Oh ma man. Ma 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 maybe I know him from like his profile, but this name, uh, doesn't ring a bell now. I'll, I'll send you his profile. He's some profound guy, but he's a, he's a, uh, um, an angel investor in Silicon Valley, but he's also like a philosopher, right? So I would like listen to some of the, the, um, podcasts and stuff he would do. And he would talk about like the impact of cryptocurrency and things like that. And then I'm like, Oh, this is crazy. It, you know, who he is now. I, I know. And I, I Googled him. Yeah. I know this yeah, guy. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, Naval uh, Ravikant. Yep. So as I'm like listening to him and then like, you know, he would say little things like he has this old tweet that would say like, um, like basically you, you're either left to play the wealth game or the status game, right? So the status game is, you know, where you went to school, kind of car you drive, the jewelry you wear, like who you hang out, where you hang out with like that, right? Or you can choose to play the wealth game and the wealth game is how long can you survive without another paycheck? So he said that and I'm like, whoa like you know that's actually deep so i start paying attention to him start listening and then he kind of led me down this rabbit hole and i'm like man what, okay why are these people buying bitcoin and saying they're never going to sell when i'm just turning a profit like you know every few months so i started kind of paying attention and i'm like okay this is something that you can hold so then what happened is during COVID when they printed off all that money, I already understood the impact of it. You know what I'm like? Oh, this is why people are like, it's not necessarily a hedge to inflation, but a solution to inflation, right? Cause at any given moment, we're always one event away from them stroking the pin. And now we're gonna flood the whole global economy with more money. And now the cost of living is going up. And then you start to put two and two together. like. The, the, the price of these assets are going up because they're propped up by all the global liquidity, you know, or the M2 money supply, the global money supply, they send assets up, they send you real estate up. They, they're what's propping, you know, Bitcoin to go, to go up too. And you're like, all this new money has to find a home, right? So if all this new money has to find a home and it's gonna find a home in real estate, well, they're just gonna make a, build a house right next to yours, right? And, or if you, all this money finds a home in stocks and then, the i don't know the, the company can say let's issue more shares so therefore you just been diluted right so everything like i was saying too about watches so everything that can grow 
like horizontally, you could just keep making more and more of it. You're just being slowly diluted, although the nominal value is going up. So then I started to really, it really started to click like, hey, well, if you can't grow this thing, Bitcoin, this way, it has to grow this way, right? So that's when it started to click and I'm like, oh, okay. So the more they pump money into the system, it's going to benefit the holders, but it's going to benefit them at a much higher rate than real estate or stocks will because you can't just duplicate real estate. I mean, duplicate uh, Bitcoin like you could a stock or like real estate, you know, so you can have a nice house in a nice area and they'll just chop down some trees and build a really nice, cool house next to you. And it's just slowly diluting you. If you watch or listen to my podcast on a regular basis, I guess you already bought some Bitcoin. And now the most important step is to keep the Bitcoin, keep them secure in a hardware wallet. My personal recommendation for hardware wallet is the Bitbox. It's super secure. It's simple to set up. It's also a perfect gift for a friend who has still the Bitcoin on an exchange. And you can get a 5% discount with the code Robin at the checkout. Visit Bitbox dot swiss slash robin to get your bitbox and the next step is to really level up your sovereignty as an individual you have to have the most secure self-custody setup you have to secure your own devices you have to protect your privacy you have to set up an inheritance plan and depending on where you live you even want to have a plan b a citizenship where you can move in case something goes really really wrong and through all those steps the Bitcoin Way is guiding you through step by step. And if you visit the bitcoinway.com slash partners slash Robin, you even get a 30 minute free call to find out how you can level up your sovereignty. And last but not least, I have something completely new for you guys. I partnered up with Coin Vigilante. This is the most beautiful Bitcoin timepiece that I ever saw created by anyone. Look at that beauty. I love it so much. Coin Vigilante made an perfect bitcoin watch that's the perfect subtle elegant way to go out there and show that you are a bitcoiner and that watch brand is bitcoin only and coin vigilante just dropped a completely new and amazing genesis edition of their watch collections you have the date of the first ever mined bitcoin block in there and of course also the block height and which epoch we are currently in i love the level of detail they put in in this masterpiece and make sure to check out those amazing coin vigilante timepieces down in the descriptions i love those watches so so much absolutely yeah uh, that's that's once you realize that like then it's like almost game over you're like just like dca all the way <laughs> yeah, yeah yep exactly and and then i think too you get to a point and you're learning because i think naturally people who especially come for the ngu like they're like man i'm gonna i can't wait for bitcoin to hit this price and this price or this price i'm gonna sell out and i'm gonna buy this and i'm gonna buy that and eventually when you you know on your when you're on your journey you come to this understanding that like why would i sell my bitcoin for dollars you know, like that's a pretty stupid trade, you know, and I think once that hits you, then you understand like, oh, this is a revolution, you know, like you, you can't tempt me with however many dollars you're going to offer me because I know you're going to offer me a lot of money in the future for something that you can't control, you know, and the point is when you go to sleep at night, you wake up, you're that much more poor because they just put more money into the ecosystem. And I think that's when it really starts to hit, like, uh, this is way bigger than just building your wealth. Do you think at some point everyone will, will, will realize that with Bitcoin or they, they just use it because they are group pressured into it and it's, uh, Bitcoin is just like the foundation of, uh, the, 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 the financial system. It's kind of like the, uh, TCP IP protocol. Everyone uses it, but nobody really understands it. Like how, how, how do you think? that will go with, with Bitcoin. Yeah, so I don't think everyone's going to look at it like it's a revolution. I think some people are going to try to ride the train, get some money, sell out, you know, get a nice car, get their, maybe even buy a home, which I don't think there's anything wrong with that at all. But no, I don't think that everyone's going to like understand the impact that this could have because, because we don't understand the system itself, right? So if we don't understand how 
the IMF is screwing countries over or how the Federal Reserve is kind of like turning us into like tax slaves. You know, like if you don't understand that, you're not going to understand the point of like holding your Bitcoin and not going back into that system, right? To sell your Bitcoins to go back into that system. So uh, I don't think everyone's going to understand that, but I do think that there will be people who understand that. And I also think there's going to be corporations who understand that as well. Yeah, absolutely. The, the the corporations will will be a huge wave. I feel like in the coming years, they they yeah. are starting to really get it the, uh, these days. Um, but do you think that Bitcoin has the potential to to make an impact uh, on society? Like to 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 <laughs> there's this popular saying, "Fix the money, fix the world." Is yeah, that actually I, true? Yeah, I th I think it has the the potential because I think it's doing it already. Like, haven't, haven't you noticed that since you like, you know, started paying attention to Bitcoin, you, things just start changing, right? You start valuing things a little different and you're like, oh, I'll put more emphasis on the future or, you know, like, I, I want to get a little more healthy, you know, you kind of just, and, it, and then it makes you align with people who have values that are similar to yours. You know, if I know somebody's a Bitcoiner, I kind of like give them the benefit of the doubt. Like, I'm like, this person's probably cool. Because to understand what, you know, is going on, you're like, I know that you have to dig deep. And uh, so I think it changes people at the individual level. But then you have to understand that individual people is what makes up companies or ma what makes up governments or what makes up countries. You know, it's the individual person. And I think sometimes that we overlook how far someone's impact can go. So if Bitcoin can change me and then I change the five people closest to me and then they change two people next to them, you know, or look how impactful someone like Michael Saylor could be, you know. So, yeah, I, I think that it for sure could underline or undermine what the system that's going on and make people start to ask questions, you know, because how much longer can you hear people say that, hey, they keep printing money and this is, you know, causing inflation and how much longer can like, let's say normies just say, no, that's not true. And then it keep happening and keep happening and keep happening. You know, like how much longer can you go on before, how, can, how much longer can this go on before people say like, all right, maybe you're right, bro. You know, maybe you're right, right? Or even like when it comes to like politics and you say, all right, they're telling you all these things that they're gonna do, but ask them how they're gonna pay for it. Eventually people are gonna say like, you know what, maybe you're right. How are you guys going to pay for it? They're going to borrow money. Well, that's going to cause more inflation. So I think each person, you know, uh, being their own little uh, uh, beacon will eventually change the world because these corporations, these countries, nation states, all these things are just made up of individual people. Absolutely. Yeah. It, it, it's so funny for me because when where when I hear like they, they they print more money to fix inflation, like you you know this politics yeah, so like yeah. the, the Inflation Reduction Act, and they yeah. print print a bunch of money to to go How that to go that. And it's and it's crazy because like you know when you say it to people who kind of aren't paying attention, you kind of sound like a conspiracy theorist, you know. But eventually they start complaining about those grocery prices, and you're like, hmm, tried to tell you a few years ago, you know. I feel I feel like the pain has to, to to grow before people actually start to wake up and actually yeah. pay attention to it. Um, how has uh, we talked a little bit about time and it kind of also goes into to the freedom? Um, how how has your um, definition or your view at time and your value at time and also maybe your definition and value of freedom changed with, with Bitcoin? So before Bitcoin, right, and I would say before I was like very like orange pilled. So before this, when I was kind of like fiat thinking, when I would wake up in the morning, the first thing that would be on my mind is make more money. Right. I was just strictly on a mission to get wealthier. Like, what does my company need to do? What does that company need to do? What stocks are moving? What stocks are undervalued? What can I buy? What can I? And all this is just to make more money. Right. And then when you make more money, you realize, like, I need to make even more money, you know? And then it's like, you go up, but then the cost of living goes up. Then you go up and the cost of living goes up. Right. So you're like, man, like, I thought maybe. 10 years ago, I thought that maybe if I had X amount of money, I would just feel comfortable. But you can't because that thing is chasing you, which is inflation is chasing you, right? So all my time was just going to like growing businesses and making more money. So then after Bitcoin, what ends up happening is I started looking at my time like, 
okay, I want to spend my time learning. I want to spend my time with my children. I want to spend my time doing all these things that have nothing to do with making money. And I can do that as long as my savings account isn't just deflating, right? So as long as my savings account isn't deflating, then I'm like, okay, cool. I don't feel the pressure anymore. You know, this morning I was going to tweet it, which I'll probably tweet it tomorrow, but I was going to say like, you know, I used to wake up in the morning and look for stocks to trade. And now I just go water my grass, you know, like I don't feel the pressure anymore. Now on top of not feeling the pressure anymore, it just makes me think like longer term, you know, like I know Bitcoin will get to where it's going to get eventually. I'm just going to focus on what's in front of me, you know, and stack sats. That's it. So whenever I get some fiat, I'll sell it in exchange for some sats. And then I'm going to do the things that I like to do. I love that so much. Uh, before Bitcoin, I went out and the first thing I looked for stocks and now I water my grass. Yeah. I, that, that's, that's so so deep ingrained in the Bitcoin community. Like that, yes. that really resonates. And I have interviewed a lot of Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoiners. You are my 277th uh, podcast. So I'm approaching the 300 uh, people. So I kind of get to know like who's a Bitcoiner. Yeah. Uh, and that's so like so char characteristic for a Bitcoiner mm -hmm. who was just in pursuit of money and found like happiness, found like this low time preference Bitcoin thing. And I, I love that so much. Thank you for sharing that. It's really the journey. It's the journey. I, it sounds so cliche, but it's like, it's the journey, man. Cause no one tells you to, Hey, stop thinking about getting Lambos. And when your Bitcoin goes up, no one tells you that, you know, you kind of naturally come to that. Like, man, these people are just making crap, you know, like the, even the devices that you buy, the things you buy from the store aren't made well anymore. You know, like everything is just real fast. There's no quality. It's just everything's just quantity, quantity, quantity. Then you start seeing that with people. And then you're like, okay, well, I'm going to spend my time with people who value the same things that I value. And then I started looking at labor that way, right? So my original saying is get money by income, right? But that was kind of, I started thinking that's kind of like fiat because you're getting money to buy income producing assets, right? And these income producing assets are all tied into the fiat world. So then I started thinking it's like, you provide value and store value. That's the, that's the new model, right? Like, so I start looking at my labor different, like there's things that I'm not willing to do for money. Like for instance, talk to somebody or have a one-on-one -on -one consultation or like, I don't want to, you can't pay me to sit and hang out with you or to talk to you, or I don't care about any of that stuff. You know, I'm going to come talk to you for free. If I want to talk to you. That's it, right? Or if I want to work, then I'm going to make sure that it's tied into love, like the labors, things that I actually want to do, you know, like, hey, I want to do this thing because it's going to help people, right? And I just started looking at everything like, like just slightly different, you know? So now I'm more like you, you provide value and then you store your value because when you provide value to people, they'll exchange it for, for money. And then you need to store your value away. And we know the best thing to store your value in, right? So you provide value, store value. And I'm like, man, it's kind of like just change. It changes you from the inside, you know? What do you think is, is harder, making money or like providing value or like keeping money and storing money? Storing money. Storing money, that's a way harder game, man. There's 52 million millionaires in the entire world, right? So if you think about this, there's probably like... 300 people in the NBA, right? For example, there's 300, three, 400 people in the NBA, right? So that should tell you like being a professional basketball is exponentially harder than making a lot of money, right? So the thing is, I think where we kind of get confused with the making money part is we don't understand that you have to go help someone else, right? So we only think about making money because we think about what we want, what we want, what we want, we, what we want. But if I told you like, hey, I have this solution for you to grow your podcast, you know, 10,000 extra listeners a month in exchange for $5,000. If that's valuable for you, you'll pay me, right? But what I'm leading with is how I'm going to help you, not what I'm going to get about out of it. So if I wake up and say, hey, I need $5,000 because I want to go buy this or I want to go on vacation, then you're walking around looking for someone willing to give you $5,000. But instead, if you look at it like... How can I help this person? Maybe this person needs to lose weight. Maybe this person needs to grow their, their whatever, their podcast. Maybe this person needs a new tire. Maybe this person needs their, their wheels aligned on their car. So then you start like, what's valuable to other people? How can I serve other people? And if you 
get that to click, what can I do to solve other people? I mean, to serve other people, then you realize that, you know, the skill of making money is just solving problems and we'll never run out of problems. You know, like we're humans, we have all these problems and we'll never run out of these problems. Therefore, there's always an opportunity to help somebody. In exchange, they'll give you some money, you know? So I think the making money part, it clicked kind of early to me. The storing money part becomes a whole different ball game because like I was saying, if you don't have something sound to store your value in, it turns you into a gambler. And the gambling mentality is hard to get out of. And a lot of times you think you're investing, but you're really gambling, right? Or you think you're trading, but you're really gambling, right? So for instance, I traded crypto, stocks, bet on sports, all these things. So I'll give you the analogy of like betting on sports, right? When you bet on sports, two teams are playing against each other. One of them has to win, right? You go buy a stock that you think is providing value, but there's all these um, moving components in the background that you don't even understand are there. You're not privy to that information, right? So although it sounds a lot better, like, well, I'm going to invest in this stock. And you're like, you don't realize you don't have enough information to make a solid decision. Therefore, you're gambling, right? So I started thinking about it like this, or, you know, you go put your money in some crypto token because it's supposed to go up and then it tanks. And then you realize one day that, some developer who developed this token also developed this other token. And then they paid some influencer to put it in front of your face and you became a victim to the algorithm that was gambling, right? So when you don't have a solid place to store the value that you've created, you start gambling, right? So whether you're, you know, sports betting or whether you're trading stocks or trading shit coins or all these things, even, you know, investing in watches, like, you're like, man, those materials can be made very easy, you know? So, <clears throat> or flipping real estate, all these things, they start to sound or seem like gambling to you when you kind of understand what's going on, you know? So then, not, not that there's anything wrong with taking calculated risks, but it makes you realize that, okay, I see my Bitcoin as a savings account, right? I bought some micro strategy the other day. I see that as an investment. Right. So it's like 99.8% of my savings account sitting in this thing. I want to speculate a little bit with this company. Here's an investment versus the fiat way to do this would be 99% of my money is invested into these companies. And I have a little bit saved, you know, just in case, because I have to absolutely get wealthier, you know, so it just swaps everything around for you. And then you can just sit down and chill. I, I love that perspective so much. Really, really cool. And this, this, this Zen moment where you're like, oh, I just store my financial energy in Bitcoin. This, this really brings something and it allows you to really focus on just providing value for other people. Yeah. Uh, kind of the origin story of this podcast, kind of. Um, yeah, really cool. One last thing before we get to the end routine uh, that I really want to get into with you. Um, being that disciplined and being like, oh, like I know where Bitcoin is going. There's like two factors that really keep like people uh, engaged with Bitcoin. The first factor is always like the price, especially for for newbies, like the the price targets. Oh, like in 10 years time, we will get there. And then only in the second order, they actually think of like, oh, like, why Bitcoin and what are the educational values of that and, and why is it so valuable for for us? Uh, do you have for the first thing, especially for the newbies, um, um, models or like what do you think of, of price models for, for Bitcoin where it's going to in the long term? Or are you just like, oh, I, I love the fundamentals and I just know uh, my money will be safe there. How do you uh, look at that? So, all right, this is the way I think about the price, right? So I used to think like, all right, when Bitcoin goes to this price, I'm going to have X amount of money. And then I started realizing like, okay, if I sell my fiat right now, because that's what you do when you buy your Bitcoin, you're selling your fiat, right? If I sell my fiat, I know my money isn't being stolen from me, right? So I started looking at it like that. Like, that's why I'm now I'm willing to buy Bitcoin at higher prices, right? So when it goes up, I'll buy it. When it goes down, I'll buy it. When it stays in the middle, I'll buy it because I'm like, I need to get rid of this thing that's allowing people to steal my time. And if I value my time, why would I let someone steal it, right? So that's the way that I look at it now. I'm like, 
well, if I keep this money sitting here and every day the money printer is going burr, so I know I'm getting poor. I know they're stealing from me. So the one thing that I say is um, like Bitcoin might go up and down, up and down on its way up, but fiat's going down only. Right. It's going straight down. It's a roller coaster straight down. And then when you get to the bottom of that pit, you're going to wish you jumped off of that roller coaster onto something else just to give yourself some type of fighting chance because you have no fighting chance with, you know, your fiat currency, especially like, well, let's say like I'm American. So the dollar, right, you know where the dollar's going, because when you grew up a can of soda is 25 cents. Now it's a dollar 70, you know, and the soda didn't get any. It didn't taste any better doesn't make you any happier, doesn't do anything, you know, doesn't do anything special except the price went up. So one, you have to give yourself a fighting chance and to give yourself a fighting chance, you got to dump the fiat. So I started looking at it like that. I, I love the way that, that you look at it. Like that the, the makes a lot of sense, really, really cool. Um, we have one question always uh, for every guest. Um, and the question is always the same one. What can we learn from you besides Bitcoin? How to spend your time how to spend your time, right? Like, so my version of the American dream, and I know a lot of Europeans share this dream, but it's, you're financially free, right? Which means you can spend, you know, on the things that you actually care about and you can earn as much as you want, you know, there's no limits. Then you have your time freedom, right? And that's the freedom to do what you want to do when you want to do it. And then the third part is your location freedom. You can go where you want to go, stay as long as you want to stay. Right. So I think, like I said, when we started this podcast, how you spend your time says a lot about yourself. Right. And how you spend your money will dictate how you spend your time. Because if you tie all your money into buying things that, let's say, financing cars or spending on credit cards, then you have to spend your time to pay those things off. Right. So those two are very, very, very correlated. Right. So besides Bitcoin, to put time at the very, very forefront of what's valuable to you, right? So if you go work all day and then you decide like, hey, I'm going to go to the mall and buy X, Y, and Z, well, you just disrespected the time that you put in to get the money, right? So that is one. And then two, the other part, which I attribute a lot of, you know, to where I've come from and where I'm at, I attribute a lot of it to curiosity. Right. So I would say to stay curious about life, to stay curious about the world and to always learn something, you know, like always, 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 you know, keep a book open, keep podcasts, like question everything. You know, I remember being 10 years old and just having crazy amounts of questions from my mom. She's like, boy, shut up. You know, like I asked too many questions, but that curiosity is what allows you to kind of like challenge what you think, you know. And that's where you start making your progress, you know, so stay curious, even if it's not money related, like. You like the other day on Twitter, everyone's going crazy about whatever it was they were going crazy about. And I followed the science page and they were showing the exact place where they found how leaves breathe, right? Like leaves take breaths, like, like a lung, it opens and it closes. And I'm like, this is the most intriguing thing ever. And, but the algorithm has stole everyone's attention. So they care about this story or this They're like, bro, you don't care about how, like, you know, these leaves are like, I don't know. So it's, but it's just curiosity, man. It's just curiosity and curiosity would take you far. And my curiosity to like how the world works and how money works and why we have to get up and leave our homes to go to work, you know, and why we stay stuck in that track. It's just curiosity. It was curiosity that, that led me here. So how you spend your time and to stay curious. Those are the main things. I, I, I love that a lot. Really, really cool. I think if, if everyone tomorrow starts to value their time and be curious they would <laughs> we, we would have all uh, a lot of people that would quit their job and, and would, <laughs> would, would try to do something else <laughs> yeah or or maybe you you don't quit your job but maybe you see your job as like a stepping stone you know and if you see your your job as a stepping stone i'm willing to bet you'd be willing to go harder you know so you can work and do things you love, right? But not everyone's in that position. Some people have to do it because they have to do it, right? But if you say, all right, well, if I put in 48 months here, right? And then I have enough money to do this or do that or whatever, you go hard because you realize like, hey, those 48 months, I need to make as much money as possible. So now let me look for opportunities to help this organization so I can get a promotion. I know this is only 48 months, so let me go harder, you know? So when you have 
no respect for your time. You don't care about like, hey, I'm sitting around at this job. I don't really do much, but they pay me to do nothing. And you're like, well, they're wasting your time and you're wasting your time, you know? So you put some more respect on your time and, you know, you demand better from yourself. Then even if you're doing those jobs you don't want to do, you do it like, and this is, you know, a building block. So I can just, you know, brick by brick, I can build something up. Very true. Really, really cool. Uh, I love that. Um, we have an end routine in the podcast where the previous guest is asking a question for the next guest without knowing who the next guest actually is. And the question for you from the previous guest is, if Bitcoin went to a million dollar, what would you treat yourself? Well, probably go buy a car from the 60s, but with my Fiat. <laughs> that, a lot of ice cream. That's it. I just want an old school car and probably some ice cream and some crab legs and I'll be all right. <laughs> <laughs> But I like to do it to say, like, I told you, you know, like, I'll, I'd go start bringing up all my old tweets, like, yeah, I should have listened. <laughs> or sometimes what I do is uh, uh, when people troll, like, let's say when I was buying Bitcoin, when it crashed down to 15,000 and people go, oh, you threw your money away. I just go leave them a winky face, you know, like, <laughs> like four years later, I have a response for you now, you know, because only time will tell you'll be judged. You'll be judged by your work in the future. You know, not today. The things that I say today might not make sense for a few years. The podcast you have, the episodes you have, the concepts that you talk about, it might not make sense to people right now. You know, you might not have the best podcast until 30 years. You know, 30 years, they'll go back and they say, oh, my goodness, these people were on to it, you know. That's how I feel about cypherpunks right now. I'm like, whoa, these guys were laying the foundation for Satoshi if he wasn't one of them, which I'm sure he was. But like, this is crazy. Like, this is, you know, 10 years before Bitcoin was created, there were people out there who were interested in cryptography and, you know, using technology as a way to free people. So it's kind of a rant. But uh, yeah, that's my answer. <laughs> I, I love that uh, a lot. Really, really cool. Thank you so much, uh, Chris, for taking the time. Before I let you go, where can people find you, ask, uh, ask your questions, read more about you? So on Instagram, it's Chris with four S's and Johnson. So Chris Johnson. On Twitter, it's CJ underscore Johnson 170H. So yeah, Thank you guys can hit me up there, bug me, DM me. I'll get back to you. Perfect. Really cool. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, thank you for, my, for, for taking the time. Also, thank you so much for everyone that is joining us today. As always, I'll be back tomorrow with another episode. Bye-bye. Cool.